we want the Charter College of Teaching to be that companion throughout your career, to be that vehicle for you to contribute to those bigger conversations, to have the opportunity to be developed through its resources, to connect with your colleagues across the sector, but also to engage in high quality professional learning, such as chartered teacher status. When you look back in your school days, it's quite hard to remember them because I suppose when you become a teacher, particularly when you've taught in quite a few schools, your immediate memory of school is the schools you work in more than the schools you went to. You can feel how much people have missed this contribution to school life. You can see the, I mean, just by the volume of audience I saw at one of our school concerts, thinking, wow, this really tells you how much people have missed this. And when I was chatting to students during a student voice session not long ago, you asked students, like, why music? Why do you, what do you think about music in this school? And interestingly, one student said, it's just so different to everything else. And she really looked forward to going to the lessons. It was a real highlight for her. When you see music on your timetable, how do you feel? Do you look forward to it or do you feel a bit nervous? And the student's like, I really look forward to it because it's so different to everything else. But why do people become members of a charter college? And I'm saying it's quite hard to convince someone, not to convince them, but to explain to someone. If you said you've got one sentence, what would you say? Why be a member? Because there's quite a lot you can say about being a member of charter college. But a teacher said it really well by saying, why would you not take the opportunity to be involved in a conversation about your profession? And I think that's really powerful. It made me think that's why we join professional bodies, because we want to have a voice within the conversation around the way we do what we do and why we do what we do. Hello and welcome to the Qualified Tutor podcast, the podcast that brings you the latest in the world of tutoring, edtech and education, and hopefully inspires in you the big change that each and every one of us is capable of. Qualified Tutor is an industry-leading tutor training organisation and online tutoring community for thousands of tutors around the world. This podcast is the voice of this community, where we aim to hear from tutors, teachers, entrepreneurs, coaches, business experts, students, tutorpreneurs, and more from the world of tutoring about what inspires them every day, how they can help tutors like you, and what they've learnt about tutoring along the way. The question is, what will you learn today? Hello and welcome, listeners, to the 116th episode of the Qualified Tutor podcast. My name is Ludo Miller, the host of this podcast. Welcome back to to regular listeners. Welcome to any of you for whom this is uh, the first time listening to this podcast. And of course, uh, a huge welcome back to today's guest, Stephen Berryman. Stephen, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you for the second invitation. Yeah, back in March 2021, some of you listeners out there will, uh, I'm sure, I hope, will have been listening to this podcast ever since then. And you may remember, Stephen, but back in March 2021, so uh, just over a year ago, we welcomed Stephen onto the podcast to discuss how the music curriculum could benefit um, the COVID recovery. We discussed Stephen's changing approach to music education since the lockdown had first hit, the role that uh, instrument learning could play in improving uh, the creativity of, of, of uh, this country's children. And we finished that conversation by talking about how tutors and, and classroom music teachers could work effectively in partnership. Now, today, Stephen joins us, uh, this podcast, as the newly announced uh, president of the Chartered College of Teaching, taking up this new role uh, this coming November 2022, um, which follows on from, uh, we were just talking about before this conversation, um, his his four, four or so years in the role of founding fellow at the college. So um, the Chartered College, for those of you who don't know the organisation, is a professional membership body and provider of uh, CPD for teachers and educators, uh, educators up and down the country and, and indeed abroad. It's, you know, um, a huge organization for teachers and has done amazing work over the pandemic and in fact since its inception in 2017. So a great deal to be excited about over the course of uh, the next few months, not least because uh, graduates of 
qualified tutor training courses can become members of the Chartered College for a discounted fee, which has proved to be uh, a very fruitful route for many tutors in our community. So with all that in mind, um, welcome back to the podcast, Stephen. Um, I believe um, the first thing to say is a huge congratulations are in order. Hey, thanks very much. <laughs> um, when did you, when, when, when was it first announced? Just so our listeners can... can um, just within the last month. Uh, so it was a, a fairly rigorous process, but it was worth the effort and the time. So it was announced uh, by the college uh, last month and had a chance to talk to Schools Week about it and share, I suppose, some of my excitement about it and what that might mean. It's the first time the college has had to recruit a president-elect. And being the first ever president-elect, I'll only be in post for about eight months before becoming president. But the next president-elect, so to speak, we will start that recruitment a year in advance of them taking over the president role. So I'll only be president without a president-elect for a year, and then the process begins again. So it's only a two-year stint. It, yeah. it feels like it's a big thing, but at the same time, I have to put it in perspective that it is only two years, so I'll have to make it count. Yeah, well, I'm sure you have um, some big plans even to fit into those two years. We'll be getting on to uh, some of those projections uh, in just a, a couple of minutes. But as regular listeners will know, we like to start this podcast um, with a little segment about uh, the school days of our guest. Um, now, I gather that obtaining some physical school reports proved a little bit tricky, but I was wondering if you would be able to tell us about some of those that school kind of teacher feedback that you that you received. <laughs> well, gosh, um, I think I mean I, when you look back in your school days, it's quite hard to remember them because I suppose when you become a teacher, particularly when you've taught in quite a few schools, your immediate memory of school is the schools you work in more than the schools you went to. Yeah. But I think probably from quite a young age, there were often comments about me being quite bossy. I think from teachers and I think I had a habit one thing I'd be told off a lot was finishing work whilst the teacher was giving me instructions of the work itself so by the time it was as if I had a personal race with myself so if they were to say you're going to do these exercises before they'd finished giving me instructions I would have finished the work so weirdly I'd often get told off because I finished the work too quickly um and I think I did many reckless things I remember trying to put something up on display without asking the teacher's permission I was stood in a chair and I fell off and then thankfully I didn't hurt myself, but there's that sense of, I think I just did what I wanted to do. I didn't quite, I mean, I was very well behaved, but I was quite, you know, determined to do what I wanted to do. But the te- teachers I had were brilliant. You know, they were hugely supportive and hugely generous with their time, particularly art teachers. The art department became this place where you'd go every break time, you'd go every lunchtime because you wanted to keep making work. And I remember one art teacher would set me challenges. You know, she said, this week, just do a painting using the colour blue. Next week, you can use green and things like that. So I think I've got really fond memories. And some of my teachers I'm still in touch with and have worked with now, you know, quite a long time later. So I've only really got positive anecdotes. But I think, yeah, I was often criticised for being bossy or um, doing things too quickly when I should have, you know, listened more carefully and then acted. Do you, do you think it would be fair, Stephen, to say that as a teacher, you were bossy as well? Probably. I mean, I think uh, it's a really tricky one, isn't it? Because I suppose you, teachers are used to controlling rooms and it, quite, it can be quite hard then when in other aspects of your life to relinquish that control. But you do learn, don't you? I think you get better at it. And I think as you graduate, so to speak, in your teaching career towards leading not only your subject, but other groups of people that you recognise it's very much a team sport. And so telling people what to do isn't something you really do anymore. I think in, in, in teaching, it's more about making space for other people to get well to be them, but to be their best selves and get the work done that needs to be done. Yeah, exactly. There's not sort of a, a single route to success, is there? No. Um, and, and, and I've I've always enjoyed this segment not only because it gives some context to uh, uh, the guests that we that we invite on, but also because it feeds very nicely into this idea around um, something that uh, the kind of American thinkers, even, uh, um, sorry, Simon Sinek uh, talks about, which is, which is this why, how, how organizations and individuals come to understand why they do what they do. Do you think your school experiences had an impact into why you do what you do today, Stephen? Oh, massively. And I think about this a lot. And I think some of your formative experiences really dictate your why 
And I look back to when I first started teaching in a boarding school in Dorset and not quite knowing what I was doing and not really having a huge amount of instruction or professional development in what I was doing. I was just left to do it. And to think it hadn't been observed in my first four years of teaching at all. So it's, there's a real vulnerability in that. And then you have to find your own why, because, you know, why am I doing this? Why am I teaching? And I guess someone said to me, when I kept moaning, I don't know how to do this. I've never done this before. I need some help. But he did say, you have been taught. And it's quite a profound statement when you think about it, that all of us have been through instruction where we hope so. And obviously there's parts of the world where education isn't the right it should be. But for so many of us, we have been taught and we have been taught for a very, very long time. And we continue to do to be taught if we get involved in various other ventures in our adult lives as well. But I suppose for me, it's that you you want people to get better. <laughs> I think that's why I do what I want to do. I want people to be their best selves. And I think in a classroom, you want them to be, if I'm teaching music, I want them to be the best musician they can be. And I suppose it doesn't mean the end goal is the same for everyone. It just means you want that journey to be the best experience it can be. It's not about setting the, the destination. It's more about the journey. And I think it's the same with why I love working with teachers. I just believe people want to be their best selves and they want to get better at what they do. And so if there's any way I can support that, either directly by providing training or indirectly by working with other people that might provide training or even more indirectly by being on a board of an organisation that might support others to do so. I think that's what drives me. How can I help people be better? And how can I help people connect to help other people be better? And I think that's what drives me. That's my why. Uh, it's about as powerful as it gets. <laughs> I mean, why should be really small, shouldn't there? I always think that. It's like an elevator pitch, isn't it? Why do we do what we do? It should be really short and really... Yeah. But I like Simon's work. I think it's really useful. Those kind of aphorisms he often tweets are quite... They're good reminders. They're good reminders to check in with yourself and think, why am I doing this? Was that a sensible decision? What else could I have done? Why am I... You know, so, yeah, I agree. I think it's good to think about your why. Yeah, he, he he recently appeared on the um, fairly uh, successful, popular podcast, The Diary of a CEO with Stephen Bartlett. If you uh, haven't heard that conversation, that is that is a, a very good explanation and, and indication of who Simon is and what his what his vision is. So, um, yeah, no, I, I, I I'm very glad that our listeners are able to hear that from you, Stephen, because that's that's a very important, um, it's a very worthy goal. Um, now, just just turning a little bit to the to the Charter College, then it, tell us a little bit more about how uh, and why you you came to be involved with the Chartered College in the first place. I wanted to get better, <laughs> and I think it's once I discovered, and I can't quite remember how I discovered. It might have been because where I was working at the time, North London Collegiate School. I think Bernice McCabe, the head teacher at the time. I think she might have been involved through the Prince's Teaching Institute, through various conversations around having a college for teaching. And it's not a new concept. There have been college of teachers for a while. I mean, as a, as a kind of concept has existed for over 100 years, in fact. But the Charter College of Teaching, uh, yeah, I became a member very quickly once I saw the opportunity existed. I can't quite remember how. It's all legend now. But I signed up. And I guess, again, it was that need to feel connected to the conversation and I was asking someone the other day about why do people become members of a charter college and I'm saying it's quite hard to convince someone not to convince them but to explain to someone if you said you've got one sentence what would you say why be a member because there's quite a lot you can say about being a member of charter college but a teacher said it really well by saying why would you not take the opportunity to be involved in the conversation about your profession I think that's really powerful. And it made me think that's why we join professional bodies, because we want to have a voice within the conversation around the way we do what we do and why we do what we do. So I think I jumped at the chance to join. And Dame Allison's been brilliant. I think right from the beginning, she's been hugely supportive and given opportunities, not just for me, but for many people like me who've joined and obviously subsequently became one of the fellows as well that we get chance to contribute to events, we get chance to speak with people that might make a difference to the classroom, not just for learners, but for teachers. And so the Charter College for me has just become this vehicle for me to contribute, again, to help make people get better, but also help myself get better. Uh, as a teacher, I've learned a lot by doing the Charter Teach programme. I've learned a lot by attending events. I've learned a lot by contributing to impact. 
I've learned a lot from being involved in any round tables that fellows have had and all the conversations you have with other members and um, colleagues at the Charter College. So it's been hugely impactful CPD. It's been the best CPD, CPD I've had in my career, I think, and particularly the Charter Teacher Status Programme just gave such huge confidence to talk about teaching and huge confidence to talk about what we do in the classroom through all the reflective assignments. And I think it's built this community of practice, other chartered teachers now that have gone on to do really great things. They've launched their own networks, they've launched their own podcasts, they've contributed to books. It's, it's really energised the expert teacher and I think it's great to have that trajectory for someone who doesn't want to become a manager because often in teaching that's all we can do is that you just keep climbing up management um, pipeline but people wanted to stay in the classroom and be a great teacher so Charter Teacher Status gave us that. But yeah, hugely impactful um, to be involved in a college. Okay, let's go. Welcome everyone to this, uh, the uh, 11 a.m. event on Monday the 24th of January at the Love Tutoring Festival. Okay, here we go. So, the first prize that we are going to give away today is number nine. Number nine is, I, I need an extra monitor, that's what I need. So, welcome to uh, the 2 p.m. keynote at the Love Tutoring Festival uh, day to Tuesday the 25th of January. It's 2 p.m. Uh, UK time where many of us here are based. Our speaker today is Michael Bungate Stanier, who is um, a, as you can see here, Wall Street uh, Journal best-selling author on coaching. Maybe I hand it back to Ludo as a kind of what needs to be said to wrap us up here. Well, uh, Michael, you've made my job very simple. It doesn't really need to be much more said. That was um, that was world class. Yes, for those of you wondering, those were just a few highlights from the incredible Love Tutoring Festival 2 that took place at the end of January of this year, 2022. The big news from Qualified Tutor and the Love Tutoring Festival team is that we're back from Monday the 27th of June to Friday the 1st of July. The Love Tutoring Festival 3 will return. The focus of this festival is on alignment and new beginnings. The festival will have a slightly different feel to it, but all of the main tenets will still be there. A host of amazing speakers, including world-renowned leaders in education, such as Craig Barton, will be joining us for a festival fanfare of training and of connection. Those are the values which hold the Love Tutoring Festival together, and those are the values that we want you to come and take part in over the week of the festival. Head to qualifiedtutor.org slash love dash tutoring dash festival or simply head to our website qualifiedtutor.org to find out more and book your ticket today now you, you mentioned uh, a number of very positive benefits there I, I can hardly believe that there are more to come but you <laughs> will be uh, the president come november of this year what what plans then have you got to build on the success of the college so far? Well, yes, it's very exciting, but it is, as I said before we started, it's very much a team sport. But even as president, I, essentially you're chairing the council members for the college and working with Dame Allison is very much a, a positive advocate for the professional body and hopefully joining in that conversation and contributing to you know, this podcast today and things like this, just helping to make sure that the purpose of the college to connect, support and celebrate teachers is well known because this is a key priority really is making sure we normalise membership of a chartered college. We want teachers to feel that as they enter the profession, they join the college because that's what you do. Teachers join the chartered college of teaching. And as I said not long ago, I think it's because you not only do you get these benefits to enhance your professional capital, you know, you have a journal impact, which is that interface between research and practice in the classroom, that mixture of academics as well as practicing teachers contributing to, to that journal. You've got a huge volume of online content. You've also got that policy 
unit, so to speak, within the Charter College that's looking at key issues such as education in times of crisis reports. And it just is that positive voice for the profession because we know it's really challenging to get teachers to stay in the profession beyond a certain period. We know retention is really challenging. So for, we want the Charter College of Teaching to be that companion throughout your career, to be that vehicle for you to contribute to those bigger conversations, to have the opportunity to be developed through its resources, to connect with your colleagues across the sector, but also to engage in high quality professional learning, such as chartered teacher status. So you can feel recognized as well as fellowship too, actually, recognized for being a great teacher and just hopefully keep being a member throughout your entire career. So I guess a major plan really is normalizing membership. So as many people as possible who are in teaching recognize the value and will join because the more of us who are members, the stronger we become as a professional body because we can be more representative faithfully of the profession to make sure we can represent more faithfully the views of everyone who teaches, not only in England, but all the four nations and across, you know, if they're teaching in British schools abroad, then that's great. We want as many of those people to feel that welcome and at home in the Charter College. It's really important, actually, that everyone who's involved in education and obviously the Charter College is for anyone involved in education between zero and 19 years of age, your students. So tutors are very much welcome as members because they're going to benefit from all the wisdom and insight collectively that the Charter College has to offer. But also all these conversations and research and form practice and all that practice and academic um, synthesis that goes on in the journal impact. I think all of this literature is going to be hugely valuable for anyone who's engaged in education, whether it be in a classroom or in um, a one-to-one or a small group tutor situation. So it's brilliant that they have the chance to be members. Impact is one of those, um, well, for those of you who don't know, Impact is the, uh, is it quarterly public? Yeah. The quarterly publication of the Chartered College of Teaching, which brings together the, the latest research and, and evidence in, into you know, pedagogical practices, into education, uh, into this this uh, essentially kind of magazine that is uh, released once a quarter. It's one of those publications that it. I wish there was more time in the day to read it all. You know, it's just I don't I don't find time to read every article, but I wish I could. Um, it's very it really thick, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it is. It's sort of Moorish almost. You know, it's very it's very hard not to keep reading even when, you know, you've got a meeting coming up or dinner's ready, you know, whatever it is. Um, so, so the, I mean, a reason alone to join the Chartered College is, is, is the impact that, you know, that, that publication that comes out. It's a, a truly, a, a real tome um, of, of education practice. Um, I, I wanted to, to, to change the conversation um, slightly, you know, looking more towards um, the role of teachers uh, and in a second uh, music teachers um, obviously that's the specialism that, that you find yourself in um, what what are kind of the big challenges for teachers over you know over the next uh, you know the next year or so especially leading into the next academic year what is it that the chartered college is focusing on in terms of problems that they are looking to solve for teachers over the next year or so Gosh, I says whoever you ask are going to give you quite a big list of uh, educational <laughs> yeah. problems because there are many. And I guess there are issues for the profession as teachers in terms of, uh, I suppose, retention. And obviously, there's a huge, quite significant piece of work happening in terms of initial teacher training now. So there's lots of early career framework. But I think, I think sort of thinking about what's going on in my own schools and thinking about the conversations I've had with other teachers and leaders, I guess is just spending that time digesting the learning from the the periods of lockdown. And I suppose I'm I'm slightly averse to saying COVID is over because I think many of us in schools will know that COVID isn't over. Um, And we continue to to tackle that absence that might be a consequence of, you know, positive tests and things like that. But I think there's a lot of learning to do. And I think schools are such fast, agile places that I just hope everyone can take the time to reflect on Obviously, there's a lot of loss, not only in terms of those that might have lost their lives to COVID, but there was a loss of ways of working where we were used to doing things in certain ways, such as parents' evenings, such as I know events where parents might come and watch parents and carers. Suddenly, all of that stopped. And whilst there can be that grief in some respect for the usual ways of working, I think we've discovered 
benefits of working in different ways, such as online parents' evenings. It's really interesting how that would be unimaginable probably a few years ago, but suddenly people thought, this is really quite good. Not only can you cut parents off after a fixed time and the appointment just ends. I think that's, a, <laughs> but I think at the same time, it, it, it's made it better for a lot of people because not only, you know, it's difficult for parents and carers to get to school sometimes. So if you've got quite a busy life or you've got work. So there have been some benefits. And I think some of the learning, particularly in terms of online tools, probably a couple of years ago, the idea of streaming a lesson or whatever word one might use, be it on Teams or Google Meets, whatever platform you did, the idea you would do that was just probably unimaginable. But to think now it's very normal to think, oh, we can just put the lesson online. And I think everyone has been remarkably agile in discovering ways of making their subject work. Obviously, some subjects do not work as well. We might have chatted about this before. And I know some of the art subjects are the ones in a recent TES article were the most jeopardised, really, by periods of lockdown. But I think a challenge, really, it's a positive one and a negative. It's really taking the time, I think, to reflect on what I've, what's the key learning from this period of lockdown and the use of technology. What can we weave back into our business as usual or life in schools? Because clearly some of these things probably enhance well-being. And I think that is a big issue for teachers. We can't underestimate that whilst teachers are remarkable people having that agility to respond and pivot to digital, still it's it's hugely fatiguing to deliver. And I think we've all recognised that as we've all increased our volume of Zoom meetings. But to deliver teaching online is hugely fatiguing for everyone. There is an element of performance to it, but also you're trying to engage people. And we know what it's like being in an online meeting when you don't want to be there. But it's different when you might have 30 people who don't want to be there and you're trying to engage and you're under pressure, I think, as a teacher to demonstrate something's happened and you made a difference to a child through your teaching. It's quite hard to do that when you're not in control of the space. So I think a huge amount of fatigue, but teachers have demonstrated a huge amount of resilience. So I think looking ahead, really, people have to think quite carefully about the well-being of staff as we, we've been through a lot of change. So leaders need to think really deeply about how am I looking after my staff? How does next year look? Can I somehow enhance or improve or minimise workload now because of the learning of the recent lockdowns through the use of technology? What might be stripped back, remove some friction or sludge, whatever word you might use, to make everyone's working life better? Because people deserve a bit more time now and space to do, be their best selves and do their best jobs, particularly after the fatigue created through quite intense working through covid and, and as I mentioned before, uh, at the start of this podcast, when, when you last joined us, we spoke about the role of the music curriculum in that exact recovery that, that you've just mentioned there. Specifically about, about the music uh, you know, uh, sector of education, then. how do you see the music curriculum's role has changed now you know, in the summer of, of 2022? Well, I guess we're now back to a bit more normal ways of working it's been a real joy to walk around and hear people singing in choirs and a real joy to see concerts again and see parents at concerts, parents and carers at concerts again because you can feel how much people have missed this contribution to school life you can see the I mean just by the volume of audience I saw at one of our school concerts thinking wow this really tells you how much people have missed this and when I was chatting to students during a student voice session not long ago, you asked students, like, why music? Why do you, what do you think about music in this school? Because, you know, obviously more than one school in our mat. And interestingly, one student said, it's just so different to everything else. And she really looked forward to going to the lessons. It was a real highlight for her. But Because I think the deputy head said, who was on the panel with me, she asked that exact question. When you see music on your timetable, how do you feel? Do you look forward to it or do you feel a bit nervous? And the student's like, I really look forward to it because it's so different to everything else. And it, oh, it's quite fun. It's quite relaxing. And as a music teacher, you think, wait, it shouldn't feel relaxing or fun. This is a serious subject. But I think I've learned really as a consequent, consequence of COVID, really, that the arts, it, it says there's no harm for the arts to be that fun and relaxing whilst we all agree as arts teachers there is a discipline there's a seriousness and there's a rigor to our subjects there's something we need to teach but I think we recognize how important these subjects are to students beyond their school life they become an outlet for their well-being to to really think deeply about complex issues so I think it's important for us as music curriculum designers and leaders of a subject 
to let there be fun and let there be relaxation if that you know that's what students need and it's brilliant in some respects that students see our subjects like that as a space to be themselves i i think we spoke about this on the first podcast i um you, you're speaking to someone to whom that relates you know entirely i think it was oh, really? it certainly felt like an escape you know being dragged out of my history you know english class to go to a music lesson um certainly felt like an escape it felt like I'd kind of almost cheated the system and won you know I was able to take this half an hour break out of you know something that all of my fellow students weren't able to do um so I think what that does for creativity um for 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 children for school students is is wonderful um and unfortunately is something that many students who who don't get the chance to play a musical instrument never they never see that they never feel that release um which which is strange you know from the perspective of someone who has done that i you and i and i imagine many other well quite and i guess that's why it's hugely important organizations such as uk music masters music in secondary schools trust who give equitable access to instrumental learning so uk music masters work with five partner schools primary schools in london Every child learns an instrument in that school. So throughout their entire school life, they're learning an instrument and engaged in really high quality music instruction with brilliant tutors. Music in secondary schools trust every child in year 7, 8 and 9 learns an orchestral instrument, um, every child, within a normal music time, kind of classroom time. And there's chance through that programme to engage with other tutoring and other Saturday morning things. But I think the more we can do to get that kind of equitable access so every child can experience working with a high quality tutor through music or learn an instrument, the better. Because I think we all recognise when you've had, I mean, I had many, 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 many years of music lessons and I still have them. And it's interesting how important that relationship becomes with that tutor, because it's the only time really in your week where you get that intense, dedicated instruction, which you don't get in a normal music class. You get an hour of someone's time and the only thing they're dealing with is you. So it's a real intensity, but also it's a real pride as you succeed at something and you feel like someone's genuinely vested in your success. So I recommend everyone gets that chance. And also it's a great chance to experience what it's like to get negative feedback <laughs> because you will be told that's not very good. It needs to be different. You need to be better. It needs to be like this. And you get pushed to improve. And I think it prepares you well for life because there will be times in your life when you get bad feedback or you get bad comments. And if you've never had that in your life, it's quite hard to deal with it. So music gives you that safe space to have a go, get it wrong and keep trying because you have that one tutor believing that you can do this and you can be better. I love that twist on it. See, it's the one time where you can, you have to learn to get negative feedback. I love that, Stephen. It's true because you, you, know, you have to deal with someone telling you that sounds terrible or no, that sounds wrong. That doesn't sound right. And it, it can be quite alarming when you have a new teacher and it can be quite upsetting, but you realise no, they're saying this because they want me to be better. And then you recognise actually you're being honest and that's because you care. It's when someone doesn't give you that type of feedback, you realise you don't care. But actually yeah. I've only had good music teachers, thank goodness, but... I think it's if ev everyone should have this experience if they can. Even if you hate it, go and have a music lesson. Even as an adult, go and have a singing lesson and just see how it feels to have that one teacher focused on you and your success for th 30 minutes, an hour. It will transform your week. Guarantee it. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I think that might be the snippet that I was talking about that we upload to YouTube. And now, a quick word from last week's guest, Sheena Aja. Hi, Sheena Aja here. Um, what did I learn from being on the Qualified Tutor podcast? Well, I learned that I really enjoyed being on podcasts and that I would um, really be very happy to do some more in the future. And what I enjoyed most about being a guest on this podcast was, I think, talking to Ludo. He made things so easy, put me at ease. He's a natural listener. He was curious and nothing felt forced. It felt really, really nice and easy. And what would I say to a future guest? Be prepared. Um, I was prepared. I sort of thought about what I was going to say and I thought very much about the audience. So who was I speaking to? And not everything went um, 
as planned, but that was in a good way. And I think that was just down to Ludo um, being such a good listener and leading the conversation in the right direction. So, yeah, I very much enjoyed it. Um, now, just to finish here, Stephen, two two relatively quick fire questions, although don't feel that you have to answer them quickly necessarily. The first one is, would you, knowing everything that you do, encourage your kids to become teachers? I think I really, really love te- I I do love teaching, but I guess I says now I've worked in six schools. I think I would encourage anyone to be a teacher if you love your subject, you love talking to people about it, and you want to make people better and be their best selves. If you don't like a fast-moving environment that places probably sometimes unreasonable demands on you um, and you have too much going on and you have to do things in 40 to 50-minute chunks and it keeps changing and you keep seeing hundreds of kids all week and it's very noisy and you might get demanding parents and you might get demanding (laughs) colleagues and you might get lots of demands, if you don't like that very febrile, high-energy environment, probably teaching isn't for you. And actually, I think the younger you go, the harder it is. And the demands, I think if you're teaching early years, you're clearly hugely brilliant because that's incredibly demanding. But again, it's very demanding to teach A-level as well. So I think it's a very fast-moving, demanding role. But if you love your subject and you can't stop talking about it, I think teaching is probably for you because it's rarely you get a chance to do that in any other workplace, really. So you'll have to wait and see until your kids either do or don't love their subject. Why? <laughs> <laughs> Finally, um, what's what's next for you, Stephen? What's next for Stephen Berryman? Apart from, obviously, uh, the Chartered College role, you, you, you're you keeping your role at the Odyssey Trust, of course. Yeah, so I keep being director in the central education team. So I think this is another perk about being a teacher. Things are never the same. And so I guess no year is the same. And already even with my own workplace you know things shift so I know next year I'm looking a lot more at curriculum development I'm looking a lot more at our relationship with partners but I think I've got some research coming up I've probably got something I should write I've probably got a bit more teaching I'm doing some teaching in a a master's program so this is what's great about working in education nothing is ever the same and every year is a whole batch of new things to do and new people to work with so yeah there's always something to look forward to, thankfully. So that's another reason why to be a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> it's never the same. Yeah. Um, Stephen, thank you so much for coming on. Um, Pleasure. I know uh, that you enjoy talking about uh, your role and your, and your, and your career. Um, it's certainly one uh, that uh, inspires and can inspire many uh, educators out there. Um, If you are thinking of joining the Chartered College, getting in there before Stephen becomes president in November, then uh, simply type in uh, chartered.college into the internet or or click on the link below. It will be in the show notes below. Um, If you're a member of the Qualified Tutor community or would like to be, uh, you can always access uh, Chartered College membership for a discounted fee uh, upon graduation of our courses. Where is the best place, Stephen, finally, if people want to get in touch with you straight after this? What's what's where should they go? Ah, they can always tweet me. I'm probably it's interesting. I think most people think if they want a quick answer from me, they tweet me. Um, which is hilarious. I keep thinking, why didn't you email me? But um, I'm very happy to be tweeted uh, at Stephen underscore Berryman. I'm very friendly and I'm always happy to chat. Look at that. That'll also be in the show notes below, so don't feel you have to memorise that handle. Um, Stephen, (laughs) for one final time, thank you very, very much for coming on. Thanks for the invite. And cheerio. We'll see you all next time, listeners. Cheerio. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Qualified Tutor Podcast. Whether you're a regular listener of this podcast or you've just stumbled across it, Join the Qualified Tutor podcast group within the Qualified Tutor community to stay up to date with our latest news, offers, workshops, and of course, simply to meet other tutors like you. Whatever your level as a tutor, our training courses will be the next step in your professional development. Visit qualifiedtutor.org slash training to find out more about our CPD accredited and Ofqual recognised courses, the first of their kind in the tutoring industry. Your student 
deserves the best tutor possible. Make that happen today by joining Qualified Tutor.